Okay, good morning, everyone. We're back in here at 7 a.m. this morning. And uh, today we're going to be going over verses 11 through 19. We're going to be focusing in on a few particular verses. So if you don't open there in your Bible, and I'll begin reading in verse 11. Truly then, if perfection was through the Levitical priestly office, for the people who had been given the law under it, <clears throat> why yet was their need? For another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not to be called according to the order of Aaron. For the priestly office having been changed of necessity, a change of law also occurs. For the one of whom these things are said is partaking of another tribe from which no one has given devotion at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord has risen out of Judah, as to which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is still more abundantly clear that if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, it has not become so according to a law of a fleshly command, but according to the power of an indissoluble life, for it is testified, you are a priest to the age, according to the order of Melchizedek. For indeed, an annulment of the preceding command comes about because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law perfected nothing but a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Okay, if you would recollect in your memory back to last week, we focused in on verse 11, and we specifically made mention of the word perfect or perfection. We made note of how that word in the Greek is very similar to the same word that Jesus used in John 19.30 when he said on the cross, it is finished. And we, we, we talked about how in, in verse 11, when he says that perfection was through the Levitical priestly office, uh, about how he's saying that the Levitical priestly office could not bring about perfection. And it says that Christ has brought that about, that Christ, according to the order of Melchizedek, has perfected the worshiper in, con in conscience. He specifically stated that he finished the work that he, the Father gave him to do when he hung on the cross, that he did what the priestly service could not do. I wrote down here in my notes a, a, an interesting way to put that. We all, we're all familiar with the word to telestai. It's been made popular in so-called Christian circles, but the majority of them don't understand the true meaning behind the word that it is finished or it is paid in full. I made mention in my notes here that there was no to telestai. There was no to telestai with the Levitical priesthood. Therefore, it was no necessary for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek. That's what the author is saying in verse 11. Now we're going to move on from verse 11. We're going to focus in on some of the following verses. In verse 12, he says, For the priestly office, having been changed of necessity, change of law also occurs. So some points that we can make about this verse is the fact that the, the law was given under the Levitical priesthood. Therefore, the change of law is mentioned here is in connection with that of the priesthood and its order of sacrifice. He says in verse 13, for the one of whom these things are said has partaken of another tribe from which no one has given devotion at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord has risen out of Judah 
as to which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So in other words, in accordance with the law, Moses, the giver of the law, said nothing about a priesthood that's coming from Judah. But Christ descended from Judah. And so the fact that another priest is arising in accordance with the order of Melchizedek and the fact that the law was given through the Aaronic priesthood means that of necessity, a change of law must occur when this priest comes in the likeness of Melchizedek. A change in law must happen. The point is that the law was given with the Aaronic priesthood. Therefore, when the new priest arises, a new law is given. Jesus obviously descended from the tribe of Judah after the flesh. The point of verse 14 is that if Moses spoke nothing about a priesthood from Judah, then the law from this one priest from Melchizedek must be different. Let's see. Verse uh, 43, verse 15 and 16. And it is more abundantly clear that if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has not become so according to a law of fleshly command, but according to the power of an indissoluble life. Or your translations might read an indestructible life. And we're going to come to this verse, understanding what we just said. We're not going to dwell. We're not going to give that much time. A lot of the antinomians like to say that a change in the law means that the whole entire Old Testament uh, law is now no longer relevant to the Christian whatsoever. We know that Paul cited the uh, fifth commandment given to Israel in Ephesians 6, verse 1. We know that Paul wrote to Timothy in, uh, I believe it's 1 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, that he said that all scripture is God-breathed, it is inspired by God, and it is profitable for teaching, for instruction, for reproving, for exhortation, etc., so that the man of God might be equipped made, and made ready for every good work. And so we're just going to say simply about that change in law, exactly what I've already said, that it's specifically dealing, the change in law that, is, that it is specifically dealing with is the change in the priesthood, the change in the Aaronic priesthood, the change, the sacrificial system is now obsolete, the covenant the, the law as it was given as a covenant of works that said, do this and live, that has been fulfilled. Christ has fulfilled that. As we mentioned last week, he was perfectly obedient to that. And so the old covenant no longer functions as a covenant. But as it is contained in the Ten Commandments, and we can speak about the, the Sabbath to an extent because the Sabbath was certain commands revolving around the Sabbath, the seventh day commandment were um, tied into that Aaronic priesthood and sacrifices were to be performed and done. And we know that Christ has fulfilled that uh, type that the Sabbath was, was picturing and that he brought us true rest and Christ. And so there are certain aspects of the law that have changed, but specifically, Speaking the fact that it is wrong to lie, it is wrong to steal, it is wrong to be an idolater, it is wrong to blaspheme the name of the Lord, your God, that we are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves as a, you could say, rule of life, that still exists for the Christian. Now, when I say rule of life, the antinomian will say, oh, he is, he's saying that life comes from the law. No, I'm not saying that life comes from the law. But as we are to conduct ourselves in this life, the law was to be the meditation of our heart. Read Psalm 119. Oh, how I love that law. How many times did the psalmist say that? Was he an unregenerate legalist? No, he had the law of God written on his heart. As Jeremiah 31 says, even back then in the Old Covenant, God 
enabled that his elect people would partake of the blessings of the new covenant and he regenerated them and he granted them faith in the true gospel and in that regeneration he gave them a new heart and he wrote his law on their heart The psalmist in that psalm said, how I have hid thy law in, in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So that's the point. The ironic priesthood, things de dealing with what some say is the ceremonial law that has been made obsolete. God no longer has a physical nation residing over in the Middle East. The true Israel of God is the church of God and our citizenship is in heaven and not in a physical body of land and so therefore the laws relating to you could say the civil commands that were given in the old testament have been not really made obsolete because we know that we can point to those laws and we can use them for disciplinary actions within the church as paul does in first corinthians chapter five but all that just to say i want to focus in on today on verse 16 You'll hear me cite this verse a lot when I'm presenting the gospel. Oftentimes I reference back to this verse to say that this is the how that Jesus satisfied the wrath of God. You'll hear me say that he satisfied the wrath of God by the power of his indestructible life. angel can satisfy the wrath of God. No man, no animal, no other created being could satisfy the wrath of God. Christ alone could satisfy the wrath of God Almighty. And he did so on the basis of his indestructible life who has become so. Verse 16. Who has become what? Who has become high priest. According or not, who has become so according to, or I'm sorry, I knew there was a negation somewhere I'm missing. Let's go back. Who has not become so according to a law of a fleshly command, but according to the power of an indissoluble life or an indestructible life. That word dissolvable, it means dissolvable. Um, here we see the basis of his becoming a priest is on the basis of his indissoluble life. The fact that his life could not be dissolved. His life could not be destroyed because his life it consisted of his deity. The fact that God became a man. His life is endless. When you look at the, uh, that word, it, it carries the idea of that it that it had neither beginning nor in, nor end. Now, now, what what led up to that statement in verse sixteen? The fact that he's referencing back to Melchizedek, and what does he say about Melchizedek? If you'll remember last week, he points at Melchizedek in Genesis, and he says that that Christ is in accordance with the order of Melchizedek. But he points at Melchizedek specifically uh, to say that Melchizedek had neither beginning nor end. And so what does he say here in verse 16 is that the fact that Christ has been made priest on that basis. That his life had neither beginning nor end. And so that is how he was in accordance with the order of Melchizedek. And we know as we looked at Melchizedek, we came to see that we believe that that was a theophany. For those of you that would like to know the reasoning behind that, you can refer back to earlier sermons. Um, but by the power of his indestructible life, he became high priest. And so his priesthood is based on his sacrifice. His priesthood is based on the fact that he satisfied the wrath of God. The fact that his offering was accepted. It was accepted by God. He died 
died on the cross. He had the sin of God's elect imputed to him, and he was treated how God's people should be treated in hell by God the Father. He cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And on the cross, he was made to undergo the wrath of God Almighty. And he turned the cup over, so to speak. The cup that he prayed over in the garden, he said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup be passed from me. But if not, let thy will be done. There was nothing left in it. He turned it over and not a drop of wrath was left in it because he drank it all and all the wrath of God that his people deserved to experience in hell, the Christ underwent and he satisfied that wrath by the power of his indestructible life. And so he became priest forever in accordance with the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 9.14, by how much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, will purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now, I want to look at a specific phrase in this verse. He says, by how much more the blood of Christ, he's making a contrast in between the Old Testament, Old Covenant sacrifices and the blood of Christ, and he says, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God. Why was it necessary that he offered himself through the eternal spirit? Eternal. Without beginning and without end. Isn't that what we're focusing on here? The fact that his life was indissoluble. It was without beginning. It was without end. The fact that it, he was in accordance with the Melchi with uh, Melchizedek, whose life was without beginning and without end. And so he offered himself to God without blemish through what? The eternal spirit. The eternal spirit. Because our sins are worthy of infinite punishment. Our sins are worthy of the eternal wrath and hatred of God. We deserve God's wrath for eternity. That's what we deserve as his people for who we are. And so Christ offered himself uh, without blemish to God through the eternal spirit in order to satisfy the wrath of God eternally speaking. And he was made priest in accordance with the order of Melchizedek. First Peter 3.18 Because Christ once suffered concerning sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, indeed being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now we'll make that clear. He suffered once for all. When I said, when the scripture says, and I reiterate the scripture, that the scripture says that he offered himself through the eternal spirit, we're not saying that he is continually being offered. He offered himself once for all. And however that happened, I'm not God. I'm not eternal. I don't exist in an eternal realm. But it happened. He offered himself through the eternal spirit. Once for God, the just for the unjust, a substitution was made. He stood in the place of those that were given to him by, by the Father. That he might bring us to God. There, there clearly, again, like we, we took a lot of time last week to discuss the intention of the death of Christ. There's the intention of the death of Christ right there that he might bring us to God. Everybody that says that Jesus died for everybody and he left it up to you to bring yourself to God, preach a false gospel. The scripture says that he gave himself the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. 
indeed being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. It is through this power that I believe that he satisfied the wrath of God. He offered himself through the eternal spirit and therefore was able to propitiate for the elect sins that deserve eternal wrath. The fact that the wrath of God was satisfied means that God stopped. God is content with the offering of his son. He ceased to pour out his wrath on Christ as Christ was offered once for all. The fact that his offering was accepted at, uh, is the basis of his being made priest. Even as the psalmist wrote Psalm 110 verse 4, we went to that verse a few weeks ago and continue to go through it. As that is one of the main verses that the author of Hebrews has in mind Jehovah has sworn and will not repent you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek the law of his priestly requirement is set forth here in this psalm Christ is a priest forever on the basis of his indestructible life it wasn't in a fleshly commandment but in the power of his life as both God and priest Therefore, a new law enters in. Therefore, the first law revolving around the Levitical priestly service is annulled and removed. There is the bringing in of a better hope, and it is on the basis of this hope, which is sure and certain, that we draw near to God. Through that priest who presents to God his sacrifice, that is finished for forever being accepted on behalf of all those that the Father had given to the Son. His work has brought his people near to God. That's the good news. That is the gospel. That is what magnifies Christ, as we spoke about earlier, as a just God and a Savior. Let's move on into our application portion. Therefore, in light of the hope that has been brought in, in light of this priest whom we worship, who has been made high priest by the power of his indestructible life, having offered himself to God through the eternal spirit, we have great confidence. And because of that confidence, we seek to live righteously before him in this present evil. Age. I want to turn your attention to Romans 5, 3 through 6. Paul writes to the church in Rome, and not only so, but we glory also in afflictions, knowing that affliction works out patience, and patience works out proven character, and proven character, hope. And the hope does not put us to shame because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. For we, we yet being without strength in due time, Christ died for ungodly ones. You see there's sort of a chain there. Not only so, but we glory in our affliction, also in, in afflictions, knowing that affliction works out patience. And patience works out proven character. And proven character, hope, which is sort of where we left Hebrews. Just remember remember that chain. We're going to come back to that. Matthew 5, 11 through 12. Blessed are you when they shall reproach you and persecute you and shall say every evil word against you, lying on account of me. Rejoice and leap for joy, for your reward is great in heaven. For in this way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And it's no coincidence that the author of Hebrews later on, as we'll, we'll see when we come to that section, uh, he tells his listeners, he tells his readers who are reading the letter that he's written to them, that uh, uh, they've underwent the plundering of their, good, of their goods, that they seen persecution for the sake of their faith. And it's because they have been given a true faith that is fixed on a certain hope. Christ said in 
Matthew 5, 11, we're blessed when people reproach us and persecute us and speak evil words against us, lying on account of him. Rejoice and leap for joy, for your reward is great in heaven. For in this way they persecuted the prophets before you. Yeah. Just try to pick up, I'm not going to comment much on these passages, try to pick up the links in between them. James 1, 2 through 4. My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the proving of your faith works patience. But let patience have its perfective work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Affliction produces patience, and patience proven character. Philippians 2, 19 through 23. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I may also be of good cheer knowing the things about you for i have no one like-minded who genuinely will care for the things about you for all seek their own things and not the things of christ jesus but you know the proof of him that as a child to a father he served with me for the gospel then i hope to send this one at once whenever i shall see the things about me how does affliction producing patience and patience producing proven character then bring about hope? Well, I don't think that it is if that it is as if hope hasn't been there, but hope being there the whole time because of our high priest, we see in our lives our sovereign God place various trials of persecution in our lives in order to glorify himself by bringing about a certain effect, that through suffering, under trials and persecutions for the gospel's sake, being hated by the world, it causes us to be patient. We see this when we proclaim the gospel to others and they rail against it. We will either be patient with them a defense for the hope that is within us or we will grow weary in doing good the lord will see to it that his people will pers persevere therefore as we are patient under persecution and trials our character is proven and who is it that is working in us to will and to do to his good pleasure it is the Spirit of God whom Christ has sent unto us. He produces all of this in his people so that they may see and witness the work of Christ, the merit of Christ being worked in his people, and therefore their hope is strengthened. Truly what is, it, truly what is out? Hope. Let me read that. Truly what is out hope, but that, that we be raised in newness of life and be conformed to the image of the Savior. So I think the point, I, maybe I worded that a little bit wrongly, but the point that I'm trying to draw out is, is that our certain hope that we are fixed on is the resurrection of the dead. And, and what is the resurrection of the dead? It is the glorification of our bodies. And our and our persons, the fact that we are made without sin, and so the, the fact that we are patient under affliction, and we see that this is pr proving our character, we can see the Spirit working in our lives, and this, this doesn't necessarily bring about our hope. We have this hope the whole time, and we are assured on the basis of the cross. But the fact. The Spirit of God is working in us to will and to do to His good pleasure. That's not like, like it's not an that's that is not like it is not an encouragement to us. The Spirit of God's work is real. He works in His people to to make them like Christ. John the Baptist said, "I must decrease, but He." must increase the spirit of god causes us 
to be conformed unto the image of Christ through these afflictions that he has set about in our lives, sovereignly ordering it, using every situation that we undergo, working these situations for our good. To the end, Philippians 3, 9 through 21, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness of law, but through the faith of Christ, having the righteousness of God on faith, to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, having been conformed to his death, if somehow I may attain to a resurrection out of the dead, not that I already received or already have been perfected, but I press on. If I also may lo lay hold in as much as I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not count myself to have laid hold, but one thing I do, forgetting the things behind and stretching forward to those things before, I press on after a mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then as many as are perfect, let us be of this mind. And if you think anything differently, God will also reveal this to you. Yet as to where we have arrived, walk by the same rule, being of the same mind. Be fellow imitators of me, brothers, and consider those walking this way, even as you have us for a pattern. For as many walk as hostile to the cross of Christ, of whom I often told you, and now weeping I say, whose end is destruction, whose God is the belly, and who glory in their shame, the one who's thinking earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven, from where we also wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our body of humiliation for it to be conformed to his body of glory according to the working of him to be able even to subject all things under himself that's 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 the end game that's where all, all things culminate when christ jesus returns and he makes a new heavens and a new earth and the dead are raised to newness of life where God's people those who have been given to the son by the father who were redeemed by the work of Christ on the cross that there they will be perfectly conformed to the image of Christ now I, I was told I've been told on several occasions those people who, who say that good works are a part of the gospel or a legalist now what do we mean when we say good works are a part of the gospel let's define what we mean what we mean is that when jesus christ died on the cross that is the cause that is the cause he died with a certain intention with a purpose to the end to bring a about an effect that is a work that is done independently of us that is a work that is done outside of us that is a work that was done without our permission we didn't ask for that work to be done for us no God did it while we were Romans Five says while we were his enemies. But that work brings about an effect. And it's not just, just the salvation of his people from the condemnation of sin. But it's also the salvation of his people from the power of sin. Like Paul wrote to Titus and he said that Christ gave himself to, to make his people zealous 
her good works. Now, is people are going to say, so you're getting your assurance from the fact that you do good works. No, my assurance is completely in the 100% in the fact that Jesus Christ lived his life on my behalf, bore my sins in his body on the tree, and was made to be a curse under the wrath of God Almighty and proved that it was satisfied by raising from the dead on the third day. But another part of what he accomplished is how I will walk after the Spirit of God gives me confidence. After the Spirit of God grants me faith and begins to work in me. Did not Jesus Christ promise the sending of the Spirit? There was a point, I believe it was in John 14, when Christ said that he has been with you, but he will be in you. He promised a sending of the Spirit of God to do what? To bring about the effect, to bring about the merit that Jesus Christ had earned for his people. What we were just speaking about in Philippians, that at all costs I might obtain the resurrection of the dead, that I will be glorified, that I will be perfectly conformed to the image of Christ. Why does that occur? Is God accepting me because of glorification? No. God forever accepts me on the basis of what Jesus Christ did 2,000 years ago. But, but nevertheless, my glorification will occur. The glorification of all of God's people will occur. God will bring it to pass. He will remove all sin from his people, subjectively speaking. That means that when you get to glory, you will no longer lie. You will no longer want to steal. You will no longer want to break the commandment of God. Your heart and the inward man will desire to do what it does for, from a proper motive. Your heart will constantly and continually in glory seek the glory of God will love God continually without fail and you will love your neighbor as yourself selflessly with a hundred percent pure motives. Why? Because God, God the potter will bring it to pass. Is that legalism? The fact that our hope is the resurrection of the dead? The fact that we want to be perfectly conformed to the image of Christ and be without sin. The fact that we want to put off this sinful flesh. No, legalism is defined as meeting a condition to receive salvation. Do we believe faith is the condition? No. We believe faith is the gift of God whereby he saves his people and imputes to them the righteousness of Christ and declares them just on that basis alone. But there is a in between state to where we have been converted and made to believe the gospel and the spirit of God begins to work in us to where we're still in this fallen flesh but we're not to regard ourselves as the flesh as Christians to where the spirit of God starts to work in us to where in Romans 8 Paul writes that we are to put to death the deeds of the body where the Holy Spirit brings about a certain zealousness for good works in his people because Christ died to the end that his people would be a people who love one another, who love God and who love one another. They're zealous for good works. That is a description of God's people. That's who they are. And it is an effect that is brought to pass by the cross of Christ. That's why the author of Hebrews could make the judgment that he made in his epistle later on when he says that 
what what son amongst you is there that is without discipline or what father amongst you is there that doesn't discipline his children even so if, if you are without discipline from god then you're not his children he said that god loves those whom he disciplines or god disciplines those whom he loves i'm sorry but the point is is, is that the author of hebrews made a certain judgment that you're not son if you're without the discipline of God. Discipline is what? It's correction for wrongdoing. How could he make that judgment? Why was the author of Hebrews not a legalist? I guess some people would say that he was a legalist who don't understand the gospel of grace. But the author of Hebrews could make that judgment in his epistle and say that you are not his children if you are without discipline because he knows that God disciplines everyone that he loves. He knows the God who saves his people. He knows the effects that Christ died to bring about in his people. He's judging by cause and effect. And people who refuse to make the judgments of scripture because they're saying that these judgments are legalism, or these people are lawless. You're always going to get the accusation back and forth in between the truth and the lie both ways. Satan will always call God the devil and God will always call the devil who he is. <clears throat> These people who only want to judge on the basis of whether or not someone says this is the gospel and I believe this certain gospel and who will not make for instance, the Galatians 5.21 judgment. And when we, when we make the Galatians 5.21 judgment, where Paul says that sorcerers and idolaters and fornicators and liars and thieves, etc., he says these people will, who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're making that judgment because those th practicing those things demonstrates that they don't believe the gospel. Because the gospel brings about a zealousness for good works. What Christ did on the cross actually produces something in the lives of his people. And people who live consistently demonstrating hatred for God and hatred for one another and who are practicing liars, adulterers, thieves, murderers, fornicators, homosexuals, etc. They will not inherit the kingdom of God because their sins are imputed to them, they're charged to them, they're still in Adam, and they will die under that guilt because Jesus Christ did not die for them. Because everyone that Christ died for, they will be given faith to believe the true gospel, and they will be given the Spirit of God to work in them, to will and to do to his good pleasure. Now, I'm not confused inflating categories, what the Spirit of God produces in us does not justify us. What justifies us is simply the work of Christ on the cross for his people. But then because that work has been made, he sends forth his Spirit into his people to bring about their zealousness for good works so that in the end game, we are perfectly conformed to the image of Christ. God doesn't leave his people alone and unto themselves to just make a profession of the gospel and then to live completely lawless, completely without instruction from God in the world. He writes his law on our hearts. He gives us a new heart that has new desires. That has new affections. And he continues to work in us as the potter, constantly working in us to bring about his intended effect. People who will only judge and say that someone is lost if they say that Jesus died for everyone or hold to a false gospel of that's clearly legalism and they are lost, but people who will only judge in that way, they're really demonstrating that what they're judging by 
is the fact that someone has the gospel right and they don't have it wrong. And they're depending on their abilities to intellectually get the gospel right. That's their condition. The fact that they've got it right, and in other words, what do they say? They're bringing the right Christ on the day of judgment. Bill Parker would say that all the time. He would say, you better make sure that you bring the right Christ on the day of judgment. Bringing the right Christ won't save you. Either Christ died for you or he didn't. If Christ died for you, that's what's going to save you. And then the way we put it is that if Christ died for you, then the Spirit will come and he will cause you to be born again and he will cause you to believe the true gospel. Belief in the true gospel and a rejection of the false gospel is a fruit of the death. And then zealousness for good works is also a fruit of the death. Zealousness for good works does not justify. Zealousness for good works does not give me assurance. Belief in the right gospel does not justify. Belief in the right in the right gospel does not give me assurance. Now listen to that very carefully. Belief in the right gospel, I do believe the right gospel. And the right gospel does instruct me where assurance is found. But my assurance does not come from my intellectual ability to get the gospel right. Have the gospel right because the Holy Spirit opened my eyes. He caused me to believe. He regenerated me. He raised me from the spiritual deadness that I was in and made me alive. That's why I believe the right gospel. And my belief in the right gospel is not a condition to be saved. All of the conditions were met 2,000 years ago. And the reason why we have have to parse it out this far and it almost gets difficult to understand the way we're parsing things out is because that's what Satan does. He tries to manipulate to a certain extent to where he gets so close to the truth but yet he wants to deviate in the slightest way possible. But the two false gospels will always be, as we have said, they will always either be rooted, and really they're part and parcel with one another, in legalism, having a condition of your salvation that's not on Christ, or antinomianism, the fact that you just have no regard for who God is whatsoever, and, and your supposed Savior that you believe in, believing in that cross, and that love doesn't motiv motivate you to love at all. It just motivates you into hatred. Because all you think about the cross is that the cross is just a get out of hell free card. And that's all that you're concerned with about it. There's no efficaciousness in it whatsoever to motivate you to love and good deeds. You don't re realize how much you've been forgiven because you haven't been forgiven. As it was written, she loved much because she had been forgiven much. That forgiveness produces a, an intended effect. The fact that God forgives his people. Read, read about that in the new covenant. He says, I, I will write my law on their hearts and they shall be my people and I will be their God. For I will forgive their iniquities and their sins I will, I will remember no more. That forgiveness that his, his people know, it causes them to do what? She loved much because she had been forgiven much. All right, moving on. Um, to our last section for today, that was application. I know that anybody that listens to this sermon who doesn't believe the gospel will be running wild with that, but that's okay. We're going to get to our last section, Antithesis. Today, I'd like to 
consider as our antithesis the heresy of annihilationism. This heresy teaches that souls that the souls of those who go to hell are annihilated after death. Though various heretics say various things about the doctrine, some advocating that the soul is immediately destroyed, while others advocate that the soul spends some time in hell before they are pooped out of existence. This runs counter to our message today, that Christ offered himself through the eternal spirit unto God. Why did he have to offer himself through the eternal spirit unto God? Because our offenses are worthy of infinite punishment because we have sinned against an infinite God. The Christian confession of faith reads, all for whom Jesus Christ did not die will live eternally in the pit of hell and will be eternally tormented for their sins. Souls who are tormented in the next life will never suffer enough to even begin to pay for as much as one sin. Scripture rejects the lie that souls in hell cease to exist or cease to be tormented as this is a denial that offending the infinitely holy God is an infinite crime deserving of infinite punishment. Scripture also rejects the lie that purgatory as well as the lie that those who perish denying the doctrines of the gospel will finally accept them in heaven. Further, denying that the eternality of hell is denial that the Lamb of God is a God of wrath. It is to deny, to deny the glory of God over vessels of wrath whom he has prepared for destruction. It defeats the very purpose of vessels of wrath ever being created for God just to simply annihilate them upon their death for any given time. Those who deny the glory of God are those who are going about to establish their own righteousness. They are those who seek their own glory rather than the glory of the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So if you'll understand what I've just said, people who advocate annihilationism, who say that after the reprobate die, the reprobate are those who are destined for wrath. These people who say that, are denying the glory of God. They're denying the fact that we deserve infinite punishment as the Christian uh, confession of faith states. But they're denying the glory of God because the glory of God is about God making known who he is. Nahum 1-2 t- tells us that the Lord is avenging and wrathful. Wrath is not, not something that is brought to pass in God because of sin. Wrath is something that exists within God. It's a part of his character. It's a part of his being. In Isaiah 63, we read that a few weeks ago, where it talked about, uh, it talked about Christ trotting the winepress of the wrath of God. And do you know what that text states? It states that the day of vengeance was in his heart. The heart of God is the very being of God. It's the very person of God. Of Christ. If you're dealing with the heart of God as divinity, that does not change. It has never changed. He's never responded to anything. So that it did change. So that it affected a change in who he is. It's always been the same. Because God is not like a man that he should change his mind or lie. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday that he is today that he will be tomorrow. And so wrath is not something that occurred because of the fall or because of man's sin. The fact that there are vessels of wrath that God has prepared for destruction as the potter over a neutral lump of clay that was not affected by sin, the 
clay of all mankind. He took one look, uh, lump and made it into a vessel of, of mercy prepared for glory. And he took another lump and he, he formed that into a vessel of wrath and he prepared it for destruction. So why would God do that? Because God wills, God has purposed to make known who he is, that's his glory. The fact that he, he reserves the prerogative to do whatever he wants with whomever he, he wants because he's the create, creator and we are the creations. We're not God, we're what has been, been made. He's made vessels of wrath that he's prepared beforehand for destruction. But what does annihilation say about these vessels of wrath that God has took the time to fatten up as a calf for the slaughter? If God just takes these vessels of wrath and just, and they're gone. Or they suffer for a time in the flames of hell and then boom, whenever the fixed time is, they're gone. It says ultimately that they serve no purpose. What does Proverbs 16 verse 4 say? That God has made everything with a purpose. Even the wicked for the day of doom or the day of evil. It's ultimately it's the day of judgment. He made them. It says that God has made them with a purpose. Even the wicked for the day of doom. And people get all upset about this because they think that they are God and they have no creation, creator, distinction. They set God below them and they judge God's ways, calling God unjust, even as the objector does in Romans 9. And what is Paul's answer unto them? Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? Will the thing formed say to the one who formed him, why have you made me this way? What does the objector say? He says, why have you made me this way? Does the potter have right, any right, to, or the, the, <laughs> the, uh, the pottery, the clay, have any right to look at the potter and say, why did you make me into this kind of pot? No. He doesn't have any right to say that but th those who advocate for annihilation they do so at the expense of the glory of god in his wrath and the vessels of wrath also serve the purpose of demonstrating to the elect what they have been spared from they take that away from god's people they take that away from God. Those who advocate for annihilationism, they have no regard for God's glory. And Romans 10, 1 through 4 tells us that those who are ignorant of God's righteousness, which is his glory, are going about to establish their own righteousness. These men do not believe the gospel. We're going to consider now some facts about the heresy of annihilationism that runs contra to the fact that Jesus Christ offered himself by the eternal spirit. Why did he need to offer himself by the eternal spirit? Because our sins are worthy of infinite punishment, of eternal wrath in hell. Therefore, he had to offer himself by the eternal spirit. Therefore, he had to come in accordance with with the order of Melchizedek, whose life had neither beginning nor end, so that he, by the power of his indestructible life, would satisfy the wrath of God. None of that makes any sense if all the wrath of God is, is just, poof, you're gone. Goodbye. That's not the wrath of God. That's the first thing. I don't have it written down here. But we'll discuss that. That's the first thing that we'll point out about annihilationism is that annihilationism does not regard the justice of God.
in the Proverbs, it says that evil men do not understand justice, but the righteous understand all things. Annihilation is not justice. Annihilation is not what our sins deserve. Annihilation is injustice. Annihilation is mercy, you could say to a certain extent. Annihilation, if I'm going to hell, I want to be annihilated in my, in, in my flesh. If I were thinking as a carnal man, as an unregenerate man, that's what I would want. If I had to admit that, 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 that everybody was not going to be saved and go to heaven, if I, if I had to reason out what I would like hell to be as a carnal man, I would want it to be annihilation. Annihilation is denial of the justice of Almighty God. Further, men continue to incur judgment in hell because they continue to sin in hell. People don't stop sinning in hell. People don't stop being depraved in hell. The Calvinists say that God removes his restraining grace from people when he takes them to hell. God never... There never was such a thing as restraining grace. People are just as self-righteous in hell as they are on earth. Men cannot satisfy the wrath of God because they do not have the power of an indestructible life. They are not the high priest. They are not in the, in the line of Melchizedek. Think about that thought for just a second. Why did I mention that? that men cannot satisfy the wrath of God in hell because they do not have the power of an indestructible life. I mention that because annihilationism says that God stops pouring his wrath out on you. Annihilationism says that God poofs you out of existence, therefore his wrath ceases. It stops, or you could say it's satisfied. A man cannot satisfy the wrath of God. The man, and, and they do say that. They do say that, ironically, that the creature satisfies the wrath of God in hell. But what's wrong about saying that the creature satisfies the wrath of God in hell? Well, the first thing is, is the fact that the creature doesn't have an indestructible life. So there's no way he can do that. He's not God. The second thing is, is that if the annihilationists are going to say, that the creature satisfies the wrath of God in hell, if they were being consistent, they should say that those who are uh, in hell satisfying the wrath of God should be raised instead of being annihilated. <laughs> because, because when Christ satisfied the wrath of God, he was resurrected on the third day. So if annihilationists were consistent they should go that route instead of saying that, we're, that the, the, the reprobate are annihilated. Because what they're saying is, is that in hell, the wrath of God is satisfied by the reprobate. So therefore, to be consistent, which they're not, they should go the route of resurrection instead of annihilation, which just further demonstrates how annihilationism is heresy because it's arrogating uh, attributes that belong to Christ alone, to the creature instead of the creator. This is idolatry. I wrote in concluding, truly these heretics are seeking to compete with the Messiah and arrogate his glory away from him and unto the sinner. As we discussed, many of these men are antinomian, which means they are not judging by the cause and effect of the cross, but rather by having the right head knowledge. Perhaps these men have this heresy of annihilationism as a failsafe, that in case they have the gospel wrong, at least they won't have to worry about eternal torment. It is no coincidence that in Psalm 110 we see judgment in the context. The high priest is both savior and judge by the power of his indestructible life, which made him priest. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Psalm of David. 
a declaration of Jehovah to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I place your enemies as your footstool. Jehovah shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion to rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people uh, shall have willingness in the day of your mind, in the majesty of holiness. From the womb of the dawn to you as the dew of your youth, Jehovah has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at your right hand shatters kings in the day of his anger. He shall judge among, judge among the nations. He shall fill with dead bodies. He shall shatter heads over much land. He shall drink out of the torrent on the way. Therefore, he shall lift up the head. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for your word. We thank you for this exhortation that was written by the author of Hebrews under your church. Pray that you would use it to instruct us, to exhort us every day in encouragement, knowing that we are founded and rooted and built up in your gospel that declares unto us that we have a righteousness that is not our own, but was established and fulfilled by your Christ, whom you sent to be um, the Messiah that was prophesied by your holy uh, prophets of old. We pray that you would encourage your people through this message and that they would understand it rightly. And we pray that you would shut the mouths of those who oppose your truth and that you would judge them. We pray, Lord, that those who are your sheep, we pray that you would call them by your name. We pray that they would hear your voice in the preaching of your gospel and that they would be called out. They would no longer follow strangers, but they would follow the voice of the good shepherd, the one who has come into this world and given his life as a ransom for his people. We pray, Lord, that these who are your people, that they would believe, Lord, and that you would declare them righteous and save them regenerate them, give them new, new life, place your spirit within them, and cause them to walk in your ways. We give you thanks, Lord, for your word, which is the true word that came down from heaven, that testifies of who you are. We pray in your son's name. Amen.